Today we come to this saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I, I, when I was a, a young child, I got sent to a prep school. And if you're in England, you know what prep schools are. They're basically there to prepare you. I mean, it does what it says on the tin, right? To prepare you to go to a good school so that then when you go to a good school, you can go to a good university so that when you go to a good university, you can get a good, good job. And so I was in this school and if you've ever been to a prep school, everything is about grades and results. It doesn't really matter like you are there to produce good grades because if you get good grades, you get to the good school. And if you get to the good school, you get to the good, you know, so, and they worked it through and it was constant pressure. And I was obviously a young, fairly serious so and so because I remember I don't know exactly what age but I was like year four or year five and I was getting all of this pressure laid on me to get good results and to get good grades and common entrances coming and they skipped us years so that you would do extra work on the same thing it was all like so intense and for me rather than finding this inspiring uh, I, I found the whole thing utterly baffling because as a young, fairly serious existential so-and-so, I had worked it all out. So I was like, so they're getting us to work extra homework and extra thing. We could get good grades so you can get to the good schools. OK, so you get to the good schools and you get to the good universities. Right. And then you get to the good universities and they never quite explained what happened after that. But I assumed they wanted us to get a nice job with more money, which meant you have a nice car and nice holidays. So, so I got to that point in my thinking, why all the pressure? But I had also realised that we all die. So if, if we all die at the end of all of this, what does it matter if I get an A or a B or a C at common entrance? Like it's all finishing anyway. And so I was like, what did, so what happened was my behaviour as I got older and older got worse and worse and worse. I found it uninspiring because I couldn't see the logic of all this pressure and my behavior got worse and so my parents decided to put me in the local comprehensive school, which is a whole other story and quite a wild experience going from a very small all boys prep school. But I thought it's about that, I think, what, what is the point? Literally, I walk home like, what is the point in all of this pressure that they're laying on us? To do, like, who cares? I didn't care. What, what does it matter? A, B, like, I think some of us, you can tell it's very real for me still, like 30 years later. Some of us <laughs> will feel this though. I think sometimes, you know, like on the way to work, have you ever had that feeling like, what's the point? Ever had that like existential, like what is the point of this? All of this pressure and work and deadlines and it's got to be done by five and everyone's stressing out and you're like, don't, don't we all die and it's all finished and no one's there to watch and like, what's, What's the point? Anyone with me? Anyone have that feeling like on the tube again at eight under someone's smelly armpit and you're like, why, oh why, Lord? If this life is so fleeting, why do we accept all of this pressure and weight to do stuff and to, like, it, it, it can feel so meaningless and fleeting sometimes. And we struggle with this. And so somehow we've got to reconcile ourselves to the fact that we are all dying like we have to somehow come to grips with this and find a way of coping in this life right now like looking back I probably could have done better at school like I probably shouldn't have misbehaved I could have done better I, I should have thought some things through but we've all got to work that through to some degree like how how do we function if we're all going to die so let me just give us a few coping mechanisms that we we take to cope with this understanding that we will all one day die. Not all, this is not comprehensive, just some of them. We naturalize death in our society. We basically say like, it's normal, it's fine. We're all gonna die, it's part of the circle of life. We've just got to embrace it as this kind of wonderful moving on that we go through. And we try and somehow make it a profound moment of renewal and, and growth. Steve Jobs, he said this, man who had diagnosed with cancer, he said, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, he says, because death is likely the very, the single best invention of life. Life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. This all sounds very iPhone-ish, but anyway. <laughs> right now, the new is you, but someday not, someday not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and the, be cleared away for the new. Sorry to be dr dr so dramatic, but it is quite true. So if Steve Jobs said it's quite true, it must be quite true. 
So it's just this kind of whole thing of the way. It's just natural. It's, 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 it's progression. Some of us live with denial. Imagine if you were on the, the, the Titanic as it was sinking and everyone is running around and screaming and the boat is tilting. You've probably seen the movie and the water's coming up to your knees and you realise that most likely you're going to die. And then as you run through one of the restaurants, you see like three or four guys in the back of the kitchen polishing the cutlery for the breakfast service at 8 a.m. tomorrow. You like, what on earth are you doing? This isn't those, there were some who played in a string quartet, right? They faced death and they decided to serve those in the face of their death. But to see some who were still polishing the cutlery for breakfast service at 8 a.m. the next day, what on earth is going on? They are in complete denial that within probably half an hour to an hour, they'll be dead. And you would shake them out of their, you know, polishing. Like, you, you've got to run, you've got to find a lifeboat. And yet for so many of us, I would suggest, we spend our days keeping our head in our work, too afraid to face up to the fact that I am going to die one day. Because if we really faced up to that fact and connected the dot of my death to the dot of my Monday morning, and if I really thought about that long enough, it would pull away far too much of how I ground my life for meaning. Uh, it would be too painful for me, too unsettling for me. So what do we do? We just fidget through our life, get busy with work, find hobbies, scroll, scroll, scroll. Let me not think about anything that's too deep and life changing like death. So we, some of us live in denial. Some of us, and there's a new, new atheism that is around us today, would say, well, what you've got to do is just face up to the cold hard facts. You were nothing. You are alive and you will be nothing. So you have a few short years to find meaning and purpose for yourself. So just find purpose, find meaning for yourself. And it's, it's kind of couched today, especially they call it the manosphere now, don't they? Like the manosphere of the YouTube and podcasts of like, it's basically, this is the brave, if you want to be a brave person today, face up to the fact that there will be nothing and find your meaning now. Which in the end, really leaves us with a very dog eat dog the strong eat the weak kind of world because if it is just now this well, it's just me i'll find my own way i don't care about anyone else or there's sentimental hope we've probably all been at funerals where someone maybe the utterly irreligious family have said it's all right because we know that nan is in a better place and we'll all see her one day we know that nan is watching on right now Anyone ever heard something like that? Two problems with that. One, there is no actual foundation for that belief. It's just something that we want to say to make us all feel a little bit better in this moment. And also this sentimental hope that one day we will see Nan in heaven and our family will be re reunited holds no moral accountability for anything that you do on this earth in this life. Because you will take two different families and they may both say exactly the same thing. You have the Joneses down the road, a nice family, you know, a couple of kids doing well. They're just nice. They help you out. They're there. Just a nice family. And at the funeral where Nan dies, they say, don't worry, everyone, we're going to see Nan. She's in heaven. She's looking down now, but she's in a better place. And then down the other road, across the street, obviously, you have the organised crime family who are involved in human trafficking, theft and, and drug dealing. And their Nan dies and they say, don't worry everyone, Nan's in a better place now. We're, we're all gonna see her, she's looking down, she's in a better place right now. So you think, okay, so the Joneses and the organized crime family get to have their Nan in heaven and looking down on. So, so who gets to have the moral high ground in this place? You quickly realize as soon as you work all of this out, and also if we're all ending up in this big waiting room of heaven where you get this big family reunion, there's all sorts of complicated, what if you don't want to be with your family anymore? And actually heaven is the opposite of family. What if you don't want to meet your nan anymore? And if the organized crime family say the same thing and the Joneses say this thing, like you realize how quickly the whole thing just falls apart. It can't be true just because you say it's true. So how do we reconcile all of this? Christianity says three things, and we're gonna dwell on the last. 
It says, firstly, that eternity is in our heart. So the reason why some of these answers to death don't actually satisfy is because deep down in our heart, we're told in Ecclesiastes 3.11, that eternity rests there, that we have been made in the image of God to live forever. So the reason why we struggle with age and ageing is because actually we are made to live forever ever. And etern- there is something that, that means that we know it should be longer than this. It, you know, we all struggle with time, right? Anyone ever, like, time passing, it's already November of 2024, right? Anyone said, oh, I can't believe it's November. Anyway, anyone said that? You're like, yeah, how many years have you been alive? How many, how many years of practice have you had? Like, you know November comes, this is the 11th month in the year, and yet still, after 30, 40, 50 years, you're like, I can't believe it's still, you know, and doesn't time sometimes feel like it's going fast and slow at the same time? I don't know, like, the holiday was so fast, but it was so slow at the same time. And you have those weird conversations, like, you, you know, we, like, we can't get to grips with time. And I want to say it's just this indication that somehow we struggle because we know we're aging and we know there's a death, but we know also that eternity is in our heart. We're meant to live forever. There's something that's meant to last about us. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this. Death is not natural. It is a judgment upon us. Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. That the reason why death is so painful is because it is us touching judgment on us for walking away from God. We have all walked away like the, the fountain of life, God himself. And we have chosen to walk away from him. And as we walk away from the fountain of life, we find ourselves dying at funerals time and time and time again. It is an unnatural God given judgment on us because we walked away from him. There is a reason why it's painful. And there's a reason why we shouldn't just try and put plasters over people's feelings and say, there, there, it's fine. No, there's a reason. God's given us this gift of feeling something, that something's not wrong. We are not right in the world. And so we have to put this together, like eternity's in our heart and we are facing judgment against our sin, therefore we die. And we have to put these two things together. We have to reconcile these two things, which brings us to the third thing that Christianity says about death. It puts Jesus at the very centre, the reconciling, powerful force of all things, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. There is an answer to the pain and to our longing. And his name is Jesus. And in this moment where we have Jesus walking into a funeral at a wake, we have Jesus teaching us and showing us how we can find peace and meaning in the light of our mortality today. So what I want to do is just look at three things. It's a good Baptist sermon, three points. We're going to look at Jesus teaching, Jesus weeping and Jesus raising. And my hope is, as we do this, meaning and purpose will arise in your heart. And for some of us, this may be the first moment that we look on Christ and we trust him for who he says he is. Amen. So three things. The first thing is this, Jesus teaches. Let me just set the scene for us for a moment, just just so we know, because we missed out. It's a long reading already, so we missed out the first bit. But Jesus has a close, close uh, family friends a brother and two sisters Lazarus and Martha and Mary they stayed in Bethany it was something of a stop off point for Jesus Bethany was just two miles outside of Jerusalem so he would often stay with these family friends and he had got to know them well and he got news that his friend Lazarus was dying very ill to the point of death and Jesus does something kind of strange that we're going to find out later he waits He deliberately doesn't go to Lazarus. He deliberately waits until he gets news that his friend, dear friend, has died. And at that point, he chooses to walk to Bethany with his disciples to meet Martha and Mary. And so we meet Jesus in verse 17, walking to the funeral. People from Jerusalem had gathered. This is probably a well-known family because people from all over were coming. And Jesus walks into the midst of this grief. And the first thing we see is this Jesus teaching in this moment. So we pick up in verse 20. So when Martha, one of the sisters, heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. 
But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, like, I know, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Just pause right there for a moment. Because the Jews, or most of the Jews, not all of the Jews, but most of the Jews had this belief that on the last day, when everyone had died, when judgment day would come, there would be a resurrection from the dead, some to eternal life and some to eternal judgment, depending on their faith in Yahweh. And so she said, no, like, Lord, I know, I know he's going to be raised one day. But Jesus then corrects her very kindly and says in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Hallelujah. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So the Jews believed that Yahweh, the great I am who I am, was going to resurrect everyone on the last day, some to eternal life, some to eternal judgment. And Jesus does something utterly radical. He inserts himself into the place of Yahweh and says, I am going to be the one who brings resurrection and life. He steps into the place of God and says, I'm going to be the one who brings resurrection and life. So in John chapter 5, just earlier, Jesus is talking about his status with God the Father. And he says, truly, truly, in verse 19, I say to you, the Son of God can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And the greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead, the Jews say, yeah, and give them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. <laughs> oh, okay. She's, he, Jesus is saying, no, no, you don't. I'm coming now. I'm going to be the one who gives life. And so we see this when he's outside of the tomb of Lazarus, just later in chapter 11, when Jesus is in prayer. Look what Jesus does. And like sometimes we can miss, we can get a bit too religious. We can miss, I think, some of the like interesting stroke funny moments. But just look, look what this in verse 41 Jesus asked them to take away the stone. They took away the stone. And then Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, so he's in prayer right now, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And then he does this kind of quasi prayer, but not prayer, kind of winking at God the Father. He says, don't worry. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And then he says, Lazarus, come out. Do you get what he's doing? So he's like, Father, I I know that we're good and we're one and I can do this without having to pray to you right now, but I'm doing it so that other people will understand what I'm about and this is why you sent me. So I'm kind of praying so that they can hear me. (laughs) Interesting thing about public prayer, right? It's different to private prayer. So he's praying so that people can hear him because he's the one who brings the resurrection and the life resurrection doesn't come through natural means it doesn't come through being a good person resurrection comes through jesus christ who inserts himself as the i am the resurrection and the life there is no resurrection to eternal life apart from through jesus that's the first thing he's saying here and the second thing he's saying here is that this is a present tense resurrection because martha's saying i know you're going to raise him one day and he's correcting her by saying no no i i am present tense i am the resurrection and the life there is going to be a resurrection today martha it's happening right now that wherever people gather to jesus there is resurrection power that explodes from death it's present tense which is where people become christians because they were once dead And they come to Christ who holds resurrection power and new birth is created and they are alive again. Becoming a Christian is not just becoming slightly more Christian in your moral thinking or you go to church now on Sunday. No, it's once you are spiritually dead and then you are made alive again in Christ Jesus. 
is present tense so that when you come to Jesus you 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 pick up his resurrection power in your life even if you're a Christian I don't know if you've ever had this experience like you come to church and you're like emotionally flatlining anyone come to church and you're just emotionally slightly numb anyone no oh, dishonest bunch you lot I, 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 oh no I always come full of the joy of the Lord Roshan asked me this morning like I was just writing getting my last minute so how are you feeling about today and I kind of looked at him semi blankly like right at seven o'clock in the morning I, honestly I was a bit like mm, I'm just I'm trusting God for resurrection power because I know enough now that when I gather and you dishonest lot gather with me <laughs> on a Sunday morning what happens is that we come into the presence of Jesus who is the resurrection and the life and resurrection power is in his presence and when we come into his presence what happens is that we pick up his power and life gets infused into our soul so that we are renewed moment by moment and we leave this place different from when we came in amen amen, amen. all right you're on now and we feel what we're doing is we're coming close to resurrection power because Christ is alive and so where we feel that we it also means for, for, for those of us who are struggling with pain and difficulty and the weight of life which in this room if we were in our quiet honest moments we would all testify to stuff that is just pressing us down it means that when we're with Christ, the present tense resurrection power is with us so that we are being renewed in our inner person moment by moment when we are with him. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 that we don't lose heart because though our outward self is wasting away, our inward self is being renewed moment by moment. Why? Because we have the resurrection power of Jesus inside of us. So that for those of us who are Christ, we may get even to win a, within a hair's breadth of complete despondency. But when we are in Christ, the resurrection and the life, there is this unquenchable flame of hope and renewal where Christ resides because he is resurrection and life. And so we never lose heart completely even though we go through dark days because we can see Christ and we know that we will be resurrected with him on the last day. Hallelujah. And it also means that because of all of this, because we will never die, life today is, is stacked with meaning and potential. Because if, 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 like even if you get to a grand old age of 82 or 85 or 90 and you pass away, like, if there's nothing, what of it? Eat, drink, be merry now, die. Like, who, what does it matter? Like, but if Christ is the resurrection and the life, and if when we're united with him, we will never die, he says. So even when we pass through the veil of death, we go straight into the presence of the glory of the Lord. As Christ said to the thief on the cross with him, today you will be with me in paradise. We will live forever from the moment you are born again and have resurrection power. If that is true, it means that everything that we are involved with is piled high with meaning and potential for the kingdom of God. Nothing is without meaning. Lunch after church is not just a neutral thing. It's stacked with meaning and potential. Your difficulty and your suffering in life is not meaningless. It is stacked with meaning and potential. Your workplace is stacked with meaning and potential. Because to quote the great theologian Maximus Aurelius, <laughs> you know where I'm going. <laughs> exactly thank you Richard everything we do in life echoes in eternity good Christian theology it's true everything we do because we will live forever just as what you do as a, at a young age has implications for old age I'm learning that at the moment because I never brushed my teeth as a kid and now I'm having all my teeth pulled out at the young age of 42 it's true, Tori's saying it's true, it's true. <laughs> One day I'm going to come to church like a gummy bear. <laughs> um, what we do in this life has implications for eternity. 
We will, we will live with implications. The, it is, everything is brimming with life right now because Christ is the resurrection and the life. Amen? And brush your teeth. That's the first thing. <laughs> Secondly, Jesus weeps. Maybe the best Bible verse to memorize in all of scripture is John chapter 11 verse 35 that says Jesus wept and why did Jesus weep because this is the resurrection and the life like he's done he set this all up deliberately he knows what he's doing he's organizing the situation so this glory may be displayed so why does he walk into this situation and start weeping he knows what's about to happen so we've got to ask why is this jesus weeping i want to suggest two things to us the first is this jesus in this moment is overcome with compassion that first of all he meets martha and he has a conversation and he teaches her and then he meets mary and something begins to break in his soul and as he sees the weeping of the family and friends and then he sees the tomb this is the trigger he sees the tomb where his friend is laid we're told jesus weeps i want to suggest that what we have here is christ the lord of all entering fully into our grief and our pain holding nothing back emotionally but allowing himself to sit with his friends and weep with them he allows his heart to be open so much so that their pain becomes his pain and he joins them 100 percent in their sorrow which is amazing because the, jesus has all of truth at his fingertips <laughs> you know if i was christ and i could raise people from the dead like that i'd be like get out of the way you don't you need to see what's going to happen just watch this guys i i don't need i don't even need to pray i'm just going to do it i'm going to call his name out watch three two, uh, that, that would be me i'd be like don't worry guys forget about it like i can do this and yet christ who is our high priest who is compassionate with all of our sorrow and all of our grief enters fully in to the emotions of the moment he allows himself to feel what they feel which is i think I mean, it's unbelievably instructive for us because christ came to bring healing and part of the healing that christ brings is being a high priest who actually walks with us and he, he doesn't look like why why are you still blubbering i'm here please stop he doesn't get exasperated by their crying his soul breaks with them which is often so different to how we treat those who are struggling with stuff that maybe we're not. We look at why, why, why all the blood, we never say it out loud, but like, why, are they, why are they so upset about that stuff they're going through? Why do they keep talking? Why do they need more prayer? Why do they need, and Christ comes and says, I'm with you. I'm with you, I'm with you. And the thing I just noticed this morning is like, you know, Christ had things to say to Mary. It's not like, I don't know what to say, I'll just cry with you. He had truth at his fingertips and yet with mary in this moment he chooses not to dispense truth he chooses not to teach which for some of us is very difficult especially when you've been a christian for a couple of months and you know you now have a, have a bible verse in your head you think oh, oh, oh you know someone's you, could you help pray for me like, i've got a bible verse for you i know something i can i can say something and you're so tempted to to share your biblical wisdom with this person he is christ who know he wrote the bible he could he could have dispensed truth and he chooses not to share truth to the point where people are looking at him saying like he could do something about this verse 37 some of them said could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying so they're looking at christ sitting with his friends thinking he looks helpless and weak sometimes to be the most helpful friend to someone who's hurting is to not say anything and to enter their emotions and just sit with them in those emotions and not say anything saying nothing could be the hardest thing and the most important thing you ever do with them to the point where other people say i i, I i've got counsel i could have given them in that moment you know i i got bible verses 
You know, you didn't know what to say, but I, I could have helped them. You just sat there and wept. Here's Christ with people looking on, think, mocking him because all he did was weep with his friends. If we want to be a, a church that brings and gives healing, I want to suggest that we need to learn from Christ who wept with his friends. And in those moments had nothing to say but just wept. Because here you have a saviour who says, I'm with you, I'm with you. I'm with you, amen? The first thing is that Christ is compassionate. And the second thing is this, I think his tears, because we know emotions can have many layers, his tears are because he is now encountering some of the final consequences of our sin and what it's gonna cost him if he wants to bring Lazarus and us out of death. Because it, this, this moment, John 11, is actually, like when you read it in, the, in the, the narrative that John gives us, there is this ominous air to John 11. Because we know now that even Thomas, you know, straightforward Thomas, Jesus says we're going to go down to Bethany, and Thomas gets it because he knows the plots that are happening with the Jews. Thomas says, right, okay, Jesus wants to go down to Bethany, he says, let's, let's go and die with him. They, they know that something is happening here. So there is this ominous air, something on the horizon that is happening in John 11. And we're told that Bethany is only two miles out of Jerusalem, the centre of power where those who are plotting to have Christ killed are currently coming to their final conclusions as to how they're going to do it. And Christ walks towards Bethany, two miles, what, 15, 20 minutes from Bethany where his crucifixion is currently being planned, where he knows this will be his final journey to Jerusalem, his final Passover. You turn the page into chapter 12, he has his triumphal entry that ends that very next week in his own death. And so for Christ, who enters into our world, with, who with, is described as a man of grief, a man of sorrows, someone who carried in his own spirit the promises over him that he himself would be the suffering servant for our sin. I don't, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a meeting or something in your future that has kind of been ominous in your life. Something that you know is coming next week in a couple of weeks. Something is it's there and it and it shapes everything, right? It's always and it's just bub. Jesus lived with this from a very young age, reading the promises, knowing that he was the suffering servant, and he carried this grief in his heart all the time. He says to his disciples in in Luke twelve that there is a baptism that I have to be baptized with, and he says, and my soul is in great distress until it's accomplished. This this distress never went away so under the surface of his teaching and his joy and his prayer and his discipleship was this grief as to this baptism his death that was to come and so when we're told with Mary we have these emotions that arise he is deeply moved and troubled in spirit what I think is going on is that the emotions that are there deep down that break forth in this moment in tears and weeping is also this awareness that he is now coming close to his own death sometimes the translators you know deeply moved and troubled in spirit it sounds it sounds quite polite but in my translation anyway, at the bottom there it says, or oh, indignation, deeply moved. Now there's a sense of anger in this. The other place is greatly troubled is later when he speaks about his own death, the crucifixion. He says, now my soul is troubled in chapter 12, verse 27. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it's for this purpose I have come. It's in the light of his own death that his soul is troubled and it breaks forth in tears. And he realises to see Lazarus come out of the tomb, it's not cost free. He can do it with a word, but it costs him his life. To see us raised from the dead to eternal life is not cost free. It's cost free to us. It costs Christ everything. 
And so in this moment, as he realises, he sees a tomb. He sees a man inside wrapped in cloth. He sees a stone that's got to be rolled away. You see all the imagery, you see all the symbolism, and he sees his own death. Maybe within like two weeks from now, this will be him. And he breaks in tears, knowing this will be me for the sake of the salvation of all those who will look on me and believe that I am the resurrection and the life. His salvation cost him everything. So we sing hallelujah to Christ, the resurrected Lord, not as one who just floated above death, but one who went through death to conquer death and be raised to a brand new life. Hallelujah. Amen. Which brings us to our last point before we take communion together. Jesus raises. Lazarus was dead, dead. We're told this because he was there for four days in the tomb. The King James Version, which I think this might be the first time I've ever quoted at Trinity Church London. The King James Version translates where like, they're resisting Jesus. Jesus says, take away the, the stone from the tomb. And they basically say, you shouldn't do that because it's been in there four days. Because after about three days, the body starts to decompose and ugly, horrible starts thing, and it starts to smell. And the King James Version translates this. Mary says, he stinketh. No lie. The body stinketh. Like he's dead, dead. Like this is not a resuscitation. This is not like, let's wait until the last minute, until he is going to die and let's bring him to life again. No, Lazarus is completely dead. And so Jesus stands at the tomb, at the edge of the tomb, and he calls out, Lazarus, come out. Just picture that with me for a moment. An amazing moment. I read commentaries to get ready for these sermons and, and biblical commentators can be a serious bunch of people and maybe rightly so because they're rightly dividing the word of truth, right? Let me come across one quote from a... I, 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 let me just read it to you, okay? Serious but biblical commentator trying to unpack the word of God, understanding what happened when Lazarus came out. Their head would have been wrapped in a separate face napkin to keep the jaw in place. So bound, a living person could still shuffle or hop, as Lazarus apparently proceeded to do so. Uh, I mean, you might not find that as funny as I did, but I, <laughs> I laughed out loud when I read that. Like, oh my, so he, this biblical commentator has imagined Lazarus wound in cloth and just... <laughs> Oh, trying to hop out of the grave he's alive Lazarus is alive and so Jesus has to say him, okay like stop the hopping Lazarus let's unbound you now so you can walk through a dad a dead man became alive hallelujah this is good uncanny unpredicted news there is resurrection where there is death hallelujah amen you can applause the Lord